I'm gonna answer 28 of your most popular questions when it comes to race, fitness, and nutrition. I'm an enduro racer that wants to lose weight. What should I do? So when it comes to losing weight, the main thing that needs to be followed is you need to be in a calorie deficit. And so what that means is you need to be burning off more calories, more energy, than what you're putting in through food. So calories go in through the different types of foods that we eat, and calories get burnt off and go out through our day-to-day -day lives, through exercise, and through being alive, and even through riding the bike as well. So if you're not losing weight, what that means is you're not in a deficit if you're just staying at the same weight. If you're gaining weight, that means you're in a calorie surplus and you're taking in too many calories for the amount of exercise that you're doing. So there's different apps that you can use to track your calories and to find out how many calories you need. So a free app that you can use is called MyFitnessPal, which will give you a rough idea of how many calories to get in and give you some sort of a platform to track your food. That's gonna make sure that you can get yourself into a deficit so that you can lose weight. The main problem that comes up is people will do really well between say Monday to Friday and they'll blow out on the weekends. They'll track and have everything dialed in Monday to Friday and then when it comes to the weekends, they kind of let loose. And the problem is when we're creating that deficit during the week, often what happens when people aren't losing weight or riders aren't losing weight is on the weekend they haven't got things dialed in and they undo their deficit. They undo all of that hard work they've done during the week and then they get to the following week and weigh in and go, they're at the same weight and they're like, hey, I've done all of this work but it's the weekend which is undone the hard work that's been done during the week. What are your top three moto supplements for hard enduro? So top three supplements, I'd say, first one is definitely carbohydrates. So carbs are your main fuel source for your riding and for your racing in hard enduro. So we wanna make sure that they're topped up. So what we use with our riders is we use things like Powerades or Powerade drinks. You can use Powerade powders. Otherwise we use carb gels and carb drinks. And so generally what we'll do is we'll work between 30 to 50 grams of carbs for every hour of riding for the hard enduro guys. And we just find with the power aids, with the carb drinks, it's easier to get in than say, trying to have a piece of fruit um, or trying to have real food. And the second thing is it's much easier to digest when you're out there riding and racing as well. The second supplement I'd say is protein. Reason protein's important is because when you're putting your body under stress, so whether that's through riding or going to the gym and training, your muscles are breaking down, and the repairing building blocks for those muscles is protein. The problem is, when we've been exercising really hard and we need that protein, our digestive system isn't working because our body's under stress. So if we're under stress and we're trying to force a steak in, it's not gonna work. And that's what I see a lot of riders doing on race day is trying to get in whole foods on race day or during a race or in the middle of race day, and it just doesn't work because your body doesn't get the protein and it just sits here and it's not getting broken down. So that's why we can use a supplement like a protein shake, um, which bypasses the di digestive process as much as we can because it's already broken down, it's in liquid form, makes it easier for our body to digest and extract those nutrients, which means we can get the protein to the muscles a lot quicker, we can recover a lot quicker, start the recovery process as early as we can. The third supplement I'd say, which is something uh, newer for me that I've been experimenting with is magnesium. The reason magnesium is important is it will help to be able to put your body under less stress, help your body to be able to recover faster, and help you to be able to get a deeper, better quality level of sleep. So your body chews through magnesium through exercise, through being under stress, and just day-to-day -day stuff. The problem is with our day-to-day -day diets, even if you're eating good quality foods, we don't get enough magnesium through those foods. So that's why supplementing with magnesium um, can be great, great for recovery, can be great for stress, can be great for getting a better quality of sleep, which is where most of our recovery is done as well. My friend said I need to cycle lots to build endurance. Is this true? So yes and no. If you're a cyclist and you need to get good at doing long distance amount of cycling, then yes, that would be true. When it comes to riding, there's, I find this is a little bit of a nuance where people get a little bit lost. And I, was, I had that same train of thought when I was racing as well. So I race mostly motocross. And in my mind, I was like, okay, if I'm doing say 15 or 20 minute motos, I should be going to the gym and doing an hour on the rower or half an hour on the exercise bike, trying to ride for as, do exercise for as long as I can. And if I can do that exercise for as long as I can, then the 20 minute moto should be easy. So I used to do lots of RPM spin classes at the gym. They used to go for 45 minutes or an hour and I do them three or four times a week. And I did that for a long time. Same with swimming. I went and did swimming, club level swimming with club like, competitive swimmers 
for five years. I'd swim three or four times a week for an hour, hour and a half. Still couldn't do a 15 or 20 minute moto on the motocross bike at race speed though. So there's a big disconnect between those two, but I just thought I wasn't going hard enough. I've just got to keep at it, you know, to tell myself all of those things. The problem was is that when I'm riding, when I'm racing, I've got a bike which is 100 kilos, right? So let's say you're racing a 250 and it's about 100, 110 kilos. You've got to be able to wrestle that 100 kilo bike around for however long your races are. So if you're doing 20 minute motocross races, you've got to wrestle around 100 kilos for 20 minutes. If you're doing three hour enduro races or four hour enduro races, you've got to wrestle around 100 kilos for three or four hours. There's no amount of cycling that you can do that's gonna build the strength that you need to wrestle around 100 kilos. And that's the bit that I missed. I was so focused on the cardio and the endurance, exactly like your friend is saying. That was my thought process, but that's the disconnect, is there's a very big difference between the resistance in a swimming pool or the resistance on the cycling bike that I was using compared to wrestling around 100 kilos. There's a massive gap between those two. So to answer the question, you've got to focus on getting stronger. The stronger you can get yourself, the lighter you can get the 100 kilos to feel. If you can get the 100 kilos to feel lighter, you're going to use a lot less energy when you ride. It's going to make it easier to wrestle the bike around on race day. How can we reduce concussions in motocross and enduro? That's an interesting question. I think there's a few different elements to that. There's the proactive and I guess the reactive side. The proactive side is what causes concussions and at the end of the day, that's crashes, people coming off their bikes. So we, there's things that we can do to prevent people from crashing or be less likely to crash. And then there's the other end of things, which is all right, if someone's already crashed, what can we do to prevent them actually getting hurt when they do crash? So you've seen different things over the years, the road racing, they've got um, say air fences. We've had neck braces over the years, which have come in and out of fashion um, and different types of protective clothing, protective gear. Um, from my side though, it's how can we stop the crashes in the first place? The equipment's great, but we don't even want, we, ideally we wouldn't want the equipment. We just wouldn't want people to crash at all. That would be the ideal, probably not attainable, but that would be the ideal is no crashes. And so one of the main causes of crashes is fatigue. It's people coming off their bikes, getting tired, riding above their ability, or trying to maintain their level of ability, even though they're super fatigued, especially in when you're doing longer races, like a 20 minute motocross race or a four hour enduro, when you get to the end of those races and you've been going hard, fatigue is an element. Fitness and strength is definitely an element. Endurance, energy is an element. And so when you put yourself in a competitive environment, but you don't have the fitness and strength to be competing at the level that you are trying to compete at, that's when you get people having crashes, having accidents coming off. Same thing that happens with CrossFit. CrossFit uses all exercises that are used in a lot of other sports and a lot of other gyms. The reason CrossFit gets a lot of uh, backlash or gets a lot of injuries is because they combine the competitive element with their training. Everyone does the training together. Everyone's competing against each other. Everyone's trying to go as hard as possible. And that's where people start to break down. Their form breaks down. They're not doing the things that they know they need to do because they're too busy trying to beat everyone else instead of focusing on their technique and moving well. And that's the same thing that happens on the bike. So to answer the question is, I think to reduce concussions, yes, there's the neck braces and the, the knee braces and all of that, but I think a bigger area is reducing fatigue. It's making sure that riders are training properly, have adequate levels of strength, adequate levels of cardio, and they're fueling themselves properly. Because it doesn't matter for a four hour enduro how good your training is or how fit and strong you are, if you're not fueling yourself properly, you're gonna hit the wall anyway and start to ride like a Gumby, make mistakes, get in other people's way, and that's where you open yourself up for a risk of injury. Um, it'd be interesting to look at the stats for motocross because obviously for motocross, you've got 40 riders going into one corner. I think the, fr the first corner's got to be like 16 meters, 12 meters. I can't remember the exact numbers. But 40 bikes don't fit into that first corner side by side. They fit onto the start gate, but they don't fit into the first corner. You would think that most of the accidents would happen when you've got 40 bikes trying to squeeze into a corner that fits, say, 15 or 10 bikes wide, right? But I, I don't know if there's stats out there or even if they even release those type of stats because they might not want them out there. But I would say that majority of the accidents don't happen in the first corner. Majority of the accidents happen on the track when people aren't even, you don't have 40 bikes going into a 12 meter or 16 meter wide corner. You've got like single bikes out on their own or one or two bikes on the track when you've got plenty of track space. And that's when majority of the big accidents happen, not in the first corner. It seems counterproductive, but it's like, why? Why would, that, why would more accidents happen when there's less bikes in a certain level of track space? And that comes down to fatigue, not, fueling yourself properly, not training properly, not having the, the strength and fitness that you need to be competitive at the level that um, you're trying to perform at. 
top three things to focus on for the roof of Africa. Yeah, so it's a big race. Generally with hard enduro and specifically for roof of Africa as well, you're doing a lot of hours of riding over multiple days. So there's three things you've got to focus on. First thing I'd say is strength. You've got to, how much does your bike weigh? 110 kilos. Plus you've got your rider weight on top of that. So let's say you weigh 80 kilos. That's 190 kilos that you have to wrestle around for your five, six, seven, eight hours a day. It's a lot of riding, it's a lot of wrestling around, it's a lot of fatigue that you're putting your body, or a lot of stress that you're putting your body under, which causes a lot of fatigue. So the stronger you can get yourself, the lighter you can get the bike to feel. If you can get the bike to feel lighter, then you'll use less energy when you ride. If you use less energy when you ride, then you'll be able to ride harder for a longer period of time. The other thing that's important with that is when you're doing multi-day events, is you're gonna carry the fatigue from day one into day two, and then day two into three, into three into four, depending on the length of the event. So the less fatigue you have on day one, the less fatigue you carry into day two, and the less fatigue you carry into day three, the less fatigue you carry into day four. So generally, most guys are good for day one. They can get through, they push through, but it's the, mul the days after that where they're carrying that fatigue, which starts to really separate everyone. So that would be the first thing. Second thing would be the cardio and the conditioning side. I find when we speak to a lot of guys that are getting ready for the roof or other multi-day hard enduro events is they've got such a focus on endurance. They think, all right, I'm gonna be riding for hours and hours. I'm gonna do lots of cycling, lots of running, lots of swimming. And so the thing that they miss is that when they're doing the six, seven hours of riding each day, they're not doing six or seven hours of continuous riding. It's not like being on a cycling bike where you're just cycling, 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 same movement for seven hours. What's happening is you're going through tough sections which exert you a lot and take a lot of effort. And then you're going through other sections which are a bit easier. So you might be going through some single trail or some flatter ground or fire trails to get to the next section. That's where you can rest. And then you've got the really tough sections like the rock gardens and the hill climbs and all of that sort of stuff, which takes a lot of physical effort. So you're going from lots of physical effort, not much. Lots of physical effort, not much. And so that's where your interval training comes in. You have to make sure that you're doing heart, sorry, where you're doing high levels of intensity for short periods of time, followed by a little bit of rest so that you can go hard again. So that's where your rowing intervals come in. That's where your running intervals come in. You can do swimming intervals if you want, not my favorite. Um, or you can do like some type of circuit training um, where you're hopping around from station to station, changing exercises every 30 seconds to a minute or so. We're trying to resemble as best we can those fluctuations of intensity out on the bike with your training during the week. Third thing I'd say is doing adequate bike time. That's, I was probably tossing up between nutrition and adequate bike time. Nutrition is definitely important, but the one that I feel called to talk about is the bike time. The reason the bike time is important is because the training that you do in, in the gym during the week, that supports the riding. It doesn't take away from the riding. So think about a football player. If a football player, like a, let's say AFL football, okay? So oval shaped football, um, running up and down the, the field, lots and lots of running. Now, if the football player spent all week just trying to get their beat test up, they just ran and ran and ran, clocked up the Ks all the time and were trying to get the best beat test they possibly could to be able to improve their running. Would they be a better football player? Chances are, probably not. The reason that they're not gonna be a better football player is because the thing that allows them to be a good football player is the skills. They've gotta know how to kick the ball, how to pass the ball, how to handball the ball, how to play the game. The running is going to help all of those things and help those skills. It's going to help them to be more consistent with them, use them all through the game and stop the drop off in those skills as they get fatigued through the game. But it's not going to replace the football skills. They still have to do the football skills. And that's the same for riding. There's a lot of guys that we chat to that get prepared for these big races. There was one guy that stands out that was getting ready for Fink Desert Race, and which is about a three hour ride for most people, three hour race. And he was going down to the motocross track and doing... 15, 20 minute motos. And so if you're doing 15 or 20 minute motos down at the motocross track, and then you're getting ready to ride, say three hours at Fink, they're not gonna cross over. They're not gonna work, okay? Because you're having too many, you're teaching your body to work for 20 minutes at a time and have breaks in between, which is not what you're gonna do at Fink. So if you're getting ready for the roof and you know you're gonna be doing long days, multiple days in a row, then you need to schedule some weekends where you do some hard riding for long periods of time. Go out and do six or seven hours a day and do that multiple days in a row so you know what it feels like, your body can get used to it, and then you can dial in your nutrition as well and make sure that you're on track when race day comes. Last thing you wanna be doing is getting to race day and your body, you're thinking that you've done all the right stuff and then it's a complete shock. 
And so from the outside looking in, it's common sense, but a lot of people get caught in that trap of not practicing how they're actually wanting to perform when they go on race. Do I need steg pegs for Fink Desert Race? I'd say a lot of guys that we work with do use them, and I find a lot of guys that do, like, say Don River Dash, Fink Desert Race, Hadar, um, Kalgoorlie Desert Race, will use steg pegs because it helps to take a little bit of the load out of your legs. The problem is it's not a crutch for doing no fitness or strength work. Um, so some guys try and use them because they're like, oh, I'll just use these instead of you training my legs or going to the gym and that'll help. Probably not gonna work that way. It's gonna give you this much of an improvement. You want a combination of both. You wanna have really strong legs, which you know are gonna get fatigued anyway. No matter how many squats, how much riding you do, your legs are gonna get tired and get fatigued. But we wanna make sure we have the drop off going like this rather than the drop off and fatigue going like that. That's what we're aiming for. So what steg pegs will do is help you to have more of a drop off like that if you combine them with strength. Um, if you are just relying on the steg pegs, then maybe you'll have a drop off like this normally, and maybe with the steg pegs, you'll have a drop off like that. But again, you don't wanna have, you wanna have a minimal drop off between start and finish. You wanna be able to stand, get up and down off, up and down on the pegs as much as you want. Not be forced to sit down through rough whoops because you're so tired and then risk coming off and getting hurt. How can I stop arm pump at Kalgoorlie Desert Race? So I'd say probably a few things, but more of, if you're getting arm pump out desert racing and out Kalgoorlie, it comes into the preparation. What are you doing beforehand? A few things that I'd check off the top of my head would be, are you doing the right type of riding? Are you practicing doing similar type of riding at those speeds? If you're not, and you're going to the motocross track and riding at 50 k's an hour, and then you're trying to ride at 120 k's plus out at Kalgoorlie, you probably are gonna be ride tight because you're scared. You're not used to riding at those speeds. If you can get yourself comfortable riding at high speed, what happens is you relax, and then when you relax, you don't ride as tight because you're comfortable with the conditions rather than being scared shitless um, when you're out there riding and racing. Other things that I would look at is, are you doing adequate strength work? The stronger you get yourself, the lighter the bike feels, the less energy you use when you ride, the more you can use your legs, the big powerhouse muscles, and less hang on for dear life using your forearms. So I'd have a look at that. The other thing I'd have a look at is nutrition. Um, if you're running out of energy and you're fatiguing, and you maybe you are doing the right strength work and you're doing cardio work, then that's also gonna cause you to be able to grip on for dear life because your legs aren't gonna have the strength there. They might have the strength there when you were fueled, but if you're not fueling yourself properly over the couple of days of racing, then they're probably gonna run out of energy. So it's making sure you're getting your carbs in, making sure you're fueling yourself the, the right way the day before. Another thing that um, is losing weight. If you're someone who's overweight, you've got five, 10, 15, 20 kilos that you need to lose. Over a, a race, so like let's say for Kalgoorlie, it's three single laps. Then we've got laps which are off the top of my head, half an hour to an hour, depending on your ability. Then you need to make sure that you are fueling yourself properly, but you also need to make sure that you are at an appropriate weight. Because if you've got 10 kilos of extra body fat and you're doing three hours of riding over the weekend, that's 10 kilos extra that you need to cart around for three hours. 10 kilos is half a bag of cement. 10 kilos is the weight of the, the back wheel off your bike. 10 kilos is like the weight of a one and a half year old. 10 kilos is the weight plate that you get from a gym of 10 kilos. You're carrying that around with you. So anytime you can reduce your body weight, if you do have excess body fat, then that's gonna make things easier for you out on the bike. What can I do to recover between days at Fink Desert Race? Great question. So for multi-day events, recovery is really important. The main thing to work on is what's called the lymphatic system. So your body has a lymphatic system which pumps, pumps lymph and white blood cells around your body. And so what happens is when our body's under stress or our muscles are breaking down from doing training or riding, is they release toxins into this lymphatic system. And that causes our body to swell and to stiffen up and feel a bit more rigid. So what we wanna do is we wanna pump those toxins out. We wanna get them flushed out as quickly as we can so our body can recover and feel great. The lymphatic system works with muscular contraction. So what that means is when our muscles are moving and active, that lymphatic system's working. When we're not moving, so like for me just sitting here now or say laying in bed or you're laying on the couch, that lymphatic system's not working. It's not being pumped around. So what we've gotta do is we've gotta make sure we get that lymphatic system working and we get those muscles pumping to get rid of all of the toxins so that we can feel better for day two. The common problem that I see here is what will happen is riders will get to the end of day one and they will go, oh, I'm recovering. And so they do the bare minimum possible. They go and rest, they go and lay down. Okay, they you know sit down, they're just being lazy, I guess, and not doing anything. And so what happens is this actually makes you feel worse 
because those toxins start to build up and build up and build up rather than actually being flushed out. And you'll find the same thing with training. If you find that you get sore with doing training and workouts, the best way to get rid of that soreness and stiffness is by actually training. But people do the opposite. They'll go and race on the weekend and be stiff and sore and then they take a week off training because they're so, so stiff and sore and they just get stuck in this vicious cycle. So to answer the question on how you can get this lymphatic system working is you do active recovery. You can just go for an easy walk after the race. Go for a walk for 15 minutes, half hour, just move your body. That's all we're looking for. You can jump on an exercise bike for a bit. If you've got a mountain bike there, just go for a bit of a pedal, go for a walk around. Go and visit some people in the campsite or in the hotel or do whatever it is that you wanna do, but just move your body, don't sit still. Other things that you can do to get that lymphatic system working, hot and cold contrast therapy. So you can jump in an ice bath and then jump out into hot water and then jump back in the ice bath and do, you know, could do 30 seconds in the cold water, minute and a half in the warm. You could do the same in the shower. Because what that will do, that's not moving your body, but it, it makes like an artificial pump. So when things are cold, they contract, okay? When they're warm, they relax a little bit more. So what we're doing is we're creating a pump with hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, personally, with like when it comes to ice baths, I'm not a fan of just ice baths. I find that they might, might make you feel better in the moment because you're frozen, your body's gone numb. But in terms of recovery, the lymphatic system works with muscular contraction. To me, it doesn't make sense if we're just freezing the body and contracting everything, but not allowing it to relax, then it's not the best way to be able to get the lymphatic system uh, working and flushed out ready for day two. It seems like you hate cycling for enduro fitness. Why? That is a good question. So it's not that I hate cycling. I just think the way it's done is not the best. And I think that there's better modes of helping riders get race fit. So... The reason that I don't like it is because most people do a lot of long distance stuff. And that, if you look at my other content, look at the other videos, I'm not gonna go into it in this, this question because it is a deeper one, is it doesn't reflect over. When you're going riding and racing, doing motocross or doing enduro, you've got fluctuations of intensity. It's not like cycling where you just cycle, 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 doing the same stuff for 20 minutes or three hours. You've got patches of the track which require a lot of effort, patches of the track which require um, some rest and are easier to get through and it bounces backwards and forwards. So going cycling for hours and hours every week, I just don't think it's the most useful, uh, use, you, the, I don't think it's the best use of your time, and I don't think it's gonna get you the best transfer over to your riding and racing. I got a lot of hate for this in the early days, back in 2015, when I first started talking about not doing long distance cycling, and all of the pros at that time were doing long distance cycling, so it makes sense. If you've got some bloke that's on the block in 2015 and all the pros are doing long distance cycling and I'm saying you lift weights and do interval work, um, I'm probably gonna get a lot of hate for that because I haven't got any credibility at that point. Now we've worked with hundreds and hundreds of riders over the years and you also see the top level guys are now doing a lot of gym work. They do a lot of strength work, they do a lot of interval work, now that's part of their training. And you'll also notice that the comments are a little bit nicer on Facebook and on YouTube as well, which is cool. But that's just part of that transition. Happened with other sports as well, with um, the NBA. Michael Jordan, uh, when he first started playing basketball, was one of the first players to start doing strength training and doing gym training to help with his basketball. At the time in the 80s, there was this myth, this misconception, they thought that if they did weights or did gym work, that it would put their jump shot off for NBA. So everyone was scared of it, anyone didn't want to go anywhere near it. Michael Jordan started doing it and he's one of the greatest players of all time. And then now every team has a strength and conditioning coach and it's normal and you get laughed at if you don't do strength work, not if you do do it. So things are changing for um, the motorsport industry and racing industry, which is great to see and the training's catching up and um, things are getting better, which is awesome. The other part to answer with that uh, question is, um, in terms of cycling, obviously it's lower body dominant. So I just think there's better ways of training cardio where you could use circuit training or if you want something that is lower impact, then you can use like a rowing machine or an assault bike, which is gonna use upper and lower body rather than just relying on the lower body all the time and putting you into an arched position where you're gonna be putting you back into um, full flexion for long periods of time. I'm 65 kilos and need to gain weight to throw my KDM 500 around. What should I do? So if you're lighter and you need to gain weight, obviously you've got the opposite problem to most people. So to gain weight, you have to be in a calorie surplus. So what that means, you have to be putting in more calories than what you're burning off. If you're relatively light for your height, then what that means is you've probably got a fast metabolism or you're active at work or a bit of both and you're chewing through the calories more than what most people are. So it is harder, gaining weight is harder than losing weight. 
for me, when I first started uh, training and in the gym, I was 68 kilos. I'm six foot two and I was 68 kilos. And my whole thing was racing is I was trying to be as light as possible. Now I'm about 90, 95 kilos. Okay, so it's a big weight gain. The problem is it's hard to gain weight because you've got to do a lot of work. You've got to get organized with your food. You've got to get more calories in. Whereas when you're losing weight, you do less work. You're eating less food, getting less calories in. So to get into the surplus, you've got to work out how many calories you need. Use an app like MyFitnessPal. You can track your food. Um, but really what you need to do is you need to get more calories in. And so often what happens is you're probably not going to feel hungry. That's why you don't eat more food. Otherwise, you would be. So the easiest way to get more calories in, and this is the strategy that I use when I've gained the weight that I have, is you want to use liquids as much as you can because we can bank, get a whole heap of calories in them, number one. And number two, it's easy to digest and sip on in comparison to food which has a lot of fiber and is more solid. So you can use protein shakes, you can use milk, you could even use chalk milk to be able to get a whole heap more calories in. So in the morning, have a um, you could have a couple of glasses of chalk milk or have a 600 ml chalk milk, you could have 600 ml of milk, you could have a protein shake in the morning and have that with your breakfast, and then you could do the same thing at dinner time. That's gonna add a decent chunk of calories if you do that every day. If you're still not gaining weight, then that's when you wanna keep cranking things up. You could add peanut butter to the protein shake, which is high in calories. You could add uh, avocado in there. There's a whole heap of stuff that you can add in there. But first of all, I'd start off with uh, milk, just because it's high in whole milk, because it's high in calories and also uh, relatively easy to digest if you don't have problems with dairy. Should I have a week off training after Don River Dash? So the reason people want to have time off after they race from training is generally because they're sore and they're tired and they're fatigued. And so this comes back to the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system works on pumping toxins out of your body. Toxins are released when there's muscle damage in the body. So there is going to be muscle damage when you go and ride and race because you're your muscles are operating at 100%, probably operating at levels further than what they're used to performing at. So there's gonna be toxins in your body which are gonna cause your body to swell a little bit, to be stiff and rigid and not feel great. That lymphatic system works with muscular contraction. The body has to be moving, the muscles have to be working, contracting and relaxing for that lymphatic system to get rid of those toxins, pump the white blood cells around so that we can feel better. What happens is riders will go and race and they've got all these toxins going around in their body and they don't feel great, and then they just go and rest all week and try and do nothing. And they actually feel worse rather than feeling better. Stretches your recovery time out a lot longer. And the reason is because the, there's no muscular contraction. The body's not moving. So it sounds counterproductive, but the best thing you can do to recover after a tough race is go and train. It's to go to the gym, it's to go and exercise, it's to go and ride again, it's to go and do something. But just do it at 60% of the intensity that you'd normally do it at. If you normally do squats at 100, do them at 60. If you normally... Um, on the rower, operating at you know two minutes per 500, operate at two minutes 15, two minutes 30 per 500. Just drop the intensity back. But the whole thing is you just want to keep your body moving. That's going to help you to recover, number one, and you're going to feel better. You're going to get more progress because if you take a week off every time you race or every time you get on the bike, you're going to miss half the year. And number three, you're going to keep up the momentum and keep in your, in your habit of training. If you don't really love training and it's not the thing you look forward to most in the week, which it's probably not because you're probably training on the weekend and not riding, um, then you're gonna get out of routine. And every time you get out of routine, it is hard to get back into routine and build momentum again. So um, rule of thumb is whether you're, you're riding or racing, whatever, keep things going, keep the momentum up. Your body's gonna feel better and mentally, it's gonna be easier to keep you in routine and keep up your progress for the year. What are the common mistakes you see PTs making when training riders for enduro fitness? There's probably a, a fair few there. I say the first thing is they don't understand the sport and that's just normal. Most personal trainers are out there, they genuinely wanna help you and they genuinely want the best for you. But when it comes to riding and racing, they don't, a lot of them, most of them, unless they've raced themselves, they don't understand the sport and the demands of the sport. So when I went and saw a PT when I was racing, they didn't know anything about riding and racing. I was like, yeah, 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 I'll get you strong. We were doing a lot of bodybuilding exercises, getting our muscles bigger and doing isolation work, right? And so the problem is, when we go and ride on the weekend, we don't have muscles working in isolation. I've got my whole body working together from head to toe. I've got my arms working, my core working, my legs working all together all at once. That's why riding's so hard. But we were doing like bicep curls and tricep extensions and stuff like that and training the body the complete opposite way to how it works on the bike. But I didn't know that because I didn't know anything, didn't know much about training at that point. And they didn't know either. They were just trying to do the right thing based on what they knew and what they'd learned with their training. Same thing with the cardio side. With this um, P2 
PT or group training that we were doing, we did a lot of long distance runs. We used to go to the beach on a Saturday and run for five Ks maybe down the beach. And so same thing, when I'm going riding and racing on the weekend, I've got fluctuations in intensity. I'm going from one corner, which might have a lot of physical effort, be very rough, take a lot of energy, to other parts of the track which don't exert me much at all, where I can sit down, it's a bit of a rest and I can recharge. I've got this up and down, up and down, up and down. Whereas what I was training my body to do with the sessions I was doing is to work at a consistent intensity for a long period of time. So I was just doing the wrong stuff. I was putting the effort in, but that's why I still wasn't able to ride a 15 minute, 20 minute motocross race at race speed. Not because the effort wasn't there, I just wasn't doing the right stuff. And at the end of the day, again, the PT's trying to do the right thing and they're trying to help me in, and they've got a certain skill set with working with general population, which works well for them. But when it comes to riding and racing, there's specific things that need to be done and specific things that don't need to be done that most PTs just don't know about because they're not racers or they haven't been racers, they don't know riding and racing. I've had lots of broken bones racing motocross. Should I drink more milk? Interesting question. So I had three broken arms when I was racing. One broken arm was from racing over 14 years, which I think is pretty good. I had a bike land on top of me. And the other two, I had one from an accident playing football and the other one was I was ran in the front, in front of a uh, swing while my brother was on it before we were supposed to race at Bustleton and got knocked over and fell on my arm and broke my arm. And same thing, I was like wondering, mum was asking the doctor, should he be having more calcium and you're drinking more milk to have stronger bones? Problem is, there's a couple of things there. Number one, to have stronger bones, calcium is not the main component of bones. It's actually protein. So if you want stronger bones, you need to be able to make sure that you're maximizing protein. The second thing that needs to happen is to get bones stronger, they need to have what's called microflexing. So microflexing happens when our body is put under load with using weights. So when we weight train, the muscles are connected to the bones and the muscles pull on the bones to be able to move the heavy loads. So what happens is there's these microflexes that happen in the bone and as those microflexes happen doing different strength exercises, the bones get stronger and more conditioned and that's how they get stronger. Now, to answer the real question, which is if you've had a lot of broken bones, it's probably got not much to do with the bones, it could do, but another part of the equation is why are you crashing so much? That's probably the real question, is why are you crashing so much that you are having so many broken bones and having big accidents? And that might come, that probably comes down to riding above your ability. If your skill level's here, but you find on race day you keep riding up here, then you're asking for trouble. You're always gonna crash. So what you need to do is go back, have a look at improving your skills up to the level that you wanna race, ride and race at. If you're getting like a bit of white line fever and you are getting a bit too competitive and riding outside of your comfort zone too often, too much, then you are gonna have crashes. And the other thing's fatigue. If you're getting tired and fatigue on the track, that's also gonna cause a lot of crashes as well because you're gonna get tired. You're gonna be trying to ride here, but your body's only at this level here and you run out of juice. Most riders fuel their bike with 98, right? 98 octane or put race fuel in it. They put the good stuff in the bike and then they run their body on 91. So they're running their body on 91 and their bike on 98. And that's why the bike is outperforming their body because their body doesn't have the juice to be able to go the distance at the level that they'd like to race at. So I'd have a look at the training, have a look at the, the fitness and strength, have a look at that side of things um, and dial that in as well. So always wanna prevent crashes. And then there's some things there that we can do to help to improve your bone strength as well. Should I take the week off training the week before Kalgoorlie Desert Race so I'm fresh? Answer is no. The reason you don't want to take a week off before you go and race is your body is used to training. So if you have been training, and let's say for our guys, they do three training sessions a week. Their body's used to training three training sessions a week. It's improving in flexibility. That's its new normal. It's new normal is three training sessions a week, lifting specific loads, doing specific exercises. What happens is when you stop training is your body tightens up and starts to contract and starts to regress. So you'll notice if you take a week off training, you go back to the gym, you don't feel as strong, but you feel very tight and very stiff. You can't get into those positions as easy as what you could before. That's what happens if you take the week off before you go and race. I used to do the same thing. I was like, oh, cool. I want to be fresh, not fatigued, as good as I can go before I go and race. And then get to race day and you feel tight and stiff. And this is what I learned through doing CrossFit competitions. I used to do CrossFit competitions and I had that same mindset. I was like training every day, training every day. And then I was like, week leading up to a comp, I'd pretty much take the week off. I'd do ridiculously low levels of training, cut my training in half because I was like, oh, I need to rest and be really, really good. And then I'd feel terrible. I'd feel worse on competition day. I'm like, I literally had better training sessions than what I've had competing out here today. And this is the, the important day. 
And the reason is because again, your body gets used to a certain level of training. So when you're coming up to a race day, you just wanna cut the volume down a little bit. So if you normally do squats with 100 kilos, do them with 80. If you normally uh, you know, row for 20 minutes, do it for 15 minutes. Just cut the volume down a little bit. So you don't want soreness. Soreness comes from doing new exercises or banging up the volume a whole heap from what you've been doing. So just cut the volume down a little bit to give your body a little bit of recovery time, but you still wanna keep it moving and active and doing all the things that it's used to. The last thing you wanna do is just take the whole week off and then go and race, because you're just gonna be stiff and rigid and not feel anywhere near as good as what you could be. I get really nervous before enduro races. Any tips? So if you get nervous before a race, there's probably a couple of causes. Is number one, you're doing an event or a race that you've never done before, which you're, you're stretching yourself. Um, or number two, you're not prepared, you're not organized for the event, or it could be a little bit of both. So if you're used to just doing club days, and then you go and decide to do Hadar Desert Race, for example, you probably are gonna be quite nervous and quite stressed, no matter how much preparation you do, because you don't know what you're in for. If you've done Hadar five times and you're going in for the sixth time, you're not gonna be anywhere near as nervous because you know what to expect, you know how to prepare, you know what's happening. So that's one side. The only way you can get over that is just putting yourself in those uncomfortable positions. It's getting out to those races more consistently and the nerves will start to drop back as you get more comfortable. The other side is you're not prepared. If you're going into, say, Fink Desert Race and you know that you haven't been training, you haven't been getting the bike time, of course you're gonna be nervous and you should be nervous because you're going into one of the biggest desert races in Australia and you haven't done the preparation or work to get ready. So that comes down to getting the appropriate bike time and then making sure that you're doing the right training, strength, fitness, nutrition stuff so that you're ready. The more prepared you are, the less stressed and nervous you'll be because you know that you're ready. If you know that you're not gonna be ready and you know that you haven't been doing the work, then you are gonna be stressed and nervous and rightfully so because you're not gonna be ready for a big race. I get cramps on long enduro rides. I'm already taking magnesium. Anything else I should do? So for cramping, the, the cause of cramping is our body's not holding onto water and we're excreting a lot of electrolytes. They're the two things that we've got to work on to stop cramping and that cause cramping. Generally, people that cramp or cramp a lot and have a big problem with it is they sweat a lot, okay? And because they sweat so much, all of the salts and electrolytes are constantly just being poured out of their body. So there's a couple of things we want to do. First thing we want to do is we want to make sure we're getting enough liquid in. 600 mils to a liter of water per hour of riding. So make sure you've got that and make sure you're actually getting it in, not just putting it in your camelback and letting it sit there. You might need more than that if you're sweating a lot or it's hot. The second thing you want to do is make sure you've got adequate carbs. Carbohydrates allow our body to be able to hold onto water. So carbohydrates, the word hydrates is in the word carbohydrates because carbs hold onto water. So when you're doing a lot of riding, if you've gone through all of your carbohydrate stores, the water has nothing to actually hold onto in the body. The carbs are like a sponge in your muscle. The water comes in and gets sucked in by that sponge. When the carbs are gone, it means we've got no sponge. And if we've got no sponge, very hard to be able to hold onto the water and keep ourselves hydrated, even if we're getting lots of water in. So use a carb gel, carb drinks, every hour, 30 to 50 grams of carbs, through a carb gel, Powerade, make sure that they're all topped up throughout the whole thing, throughout your whole ride. Second thing is then electrolytes. So if you're sweating a lot, electrolytes are being excreted, excreted, excreted. If they're not being replaced, again, gonna be very hard for your body to be able to operate at 100%. What electrolytes work on is there's a connection between your brain and muscles. Your brain sends a message to your muscles to contract and relax. So when I move my arm now, I'm choosing to move my arm. First, my brain chooses to move my hands and my arm, or sorry, my hands and my fingers, and then they actually move. It sends a signal from here all the way down to the muscles that I'm trying to contract and trying to move. What happens is electrolytes are responsible for that connection. When your electrolytes are low, that connection starts to break down. It's like having a shitty Wi-Fi connection where the internet's cutting in and out all the time. That's what happens with cramping, is your brain starts sending messages on and off to different muscle groups like this without you telling it to, without you being in control. So the way we replace those electrolytes is you can use a drink like Powerade. Otherwise, if you're already supplementing with magnesium, the other thing that I would supplement with um, is salt. So you can add one, if off the top of my head, it'd be like one third of a teaspoon to every liter of water that you have of, um, you can use sea salt. And what that will do is make sure that you're getting plenty of sodium into your body and replacing what you're losing. You find if you do sweat a lot, if you let the sweat dry, that your skin feels very rough, almost feels sandy. 
and that sand is salt being excreted from your body. So we want to um, top that up and replace it as we're losing it as best we can. Again, if you are cramping, you're probably gonna find that you do sweat a lot and you're excreting a lot of stuff, electrolytes that are coming out of your body. So we've gotta be on top of that to keep replacing it. Is motocross fitness training different to enduro fitness training? That's a good question. So yes, they are different, but the differences come from the actual riding on the bike, not from the training. The goal of the training is not to replicate racing. We're not trying to replicate motocross or replicate enduro during the week. So I see these funny different machines that have come out over the years that are like motorbikes on a spring, motorbikes on a stand that uh, like look like they are like for people to train during the week as if they're on the bike. And they don't work. That's the reason why they don't stick around and they keep coming out with all these different variations and companies start and close down. Same as the moto supplement industry, but that's a whole nother story. Is because what we're doing in the gym is we're trying to build strength and get you stronger at moving your whole body together. And we're trying to build your cardio system in the same way that it's used on the bike. The way that we do that is through certain strength exercises and certain cardio exercises or ways of training. We're not trying to mimic three hours of enduro riding. We're trying to mimic 20 minutes of motocross in the gym. The motocross and the enduro is the skills, okay? We're trying to get good at the skills by doing the skills. So motocross, if you wanna get good at doing 20 minute motos, do 20 minute motos. You wanna get good at enduro riding for three hours, do riding for three hours. But the thing that supports those is the gym work. We're not trying to replicate just more riding and more skill stuff during the week in a gym format just because you can't get on the bike. The goal of the training during the week is to get you stronger, to get you fitter, and that supports all of the skills that you're building on the bike. Is arm pump permanent or can I get rid of it? So yes, you can get rid of arm pump. There's five causes of arm pump. Um, there's a video on this if you wanna find it on the channel, which will go into more detail. But to give you the five causes, is number one, you're not strong enough. Okay, so if you haven't got the right level of strength, the bike's gonna feel heavy. If the bike feels heavy, you get fatigued. If you get fatigued, your legs don't hold onto the bike and you just start hanging on with your arms and they get overworked. Number two, cardio. If you get out of breath or you're not doing the right type of cardio, again, your body fatigues, the rest of your body's not doing the work, you're just hanging on for dear life, your arms get overworked. Third thing, nutrition. If your nutrition's not dialed in, you get fatigued, your body stops doing all the work, your legs stop gripping onto the bike, your arms start to work over time. Four, mobility and flexibility. Um, this one's usually only an issue if you had like some sort of arm injury, you'll find that one arm will be more flexible and a lot stronger than the other. If you've had a broken wrist, broken arm, broken elbow, that will generally contribute to it. And the fifth one's bike time for arm pump. So if you are not doing any riding and just training all the time, you're probably gonna get arm pump and it's just because you're uncomfortable on the bike. And the reason you're uncomfortable on the bike is because you haven't ridden it. When you go and do something a lot, like ride the bike once a week, you get comfortable, you relax a bit more, you don't hold on as tight. If you don't ride for six months, you're gonna hold on for dear life because you haven't ridden for so long, you feel uncomfortable, you don't know what's gonna happen. There's two types of arm pump, type one and type two. Type one arm pump comes on at the start of the ride and disappears. If that's the case, it means you've got a warming up problem. You're just not warm, your bodies aren't warm, your mu muscles are cold, they're not contracting and relaxing very well and they're not very strong, or you're not comfortable in the conditions you're riding in. You just got out on the bike, you're not comfortable with where you're riding, you're getting used to the bike, and then after you ride for 10 minutes, it disappears. Type two is what is when arm pump is non-existent or mild at the start and gets worse as you keep riding. That's where you'd use those five causes and find out um, what's actually causing them. There's a few moto supplements I see advertised at the track. Do they actually work? Work in terms of what they claim to do? I'd say probably not. Work as in give you some sort of progress? I'd say yes. Um, since 2015, when I first started coaching races, been a lot of different supplement uh, brand, moto supplements that have come out and gone. They've been popular, all the top riders are using them and then all of a sudden they just disappear. So supplements in general, they're not gonna give you life-changing results. The, the strength and the fitness work and the gym work, that's gonna give you the result, 99% of the result. That's gonna give you this much progress. The supplements are gonna give you this much progress. But you need that base layer first. You need that 95, 99% first to be able to then get these. Um, it's easy to chase these because they're easy. You just pop a supplement, but they're probably not gonna give you the results that you're after. In terms of like some supplements say, oh, you get rid of arm pump and does this and does that. It's probably not gonna do that for you. If it does, great, good on you. But most of the time it's not. So supplements are good for supplementing. If they're carb drinks or protein drinks and things like that, but other ones that make big bold claims about like getting rid of arm pump, they come into the industry, everyone says, oh wow, this is great, got rid of my arm pump, but then the 
business disappears and it's gone. And, and that's usually because the claims that they make don't actually add up to what's happening in real life. People don't keep buying the product and getting it. So the business goes out of business. So they either go out of business or they are forced to come up with like a 2.0, this one's better, blah, 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 to be able to keep their business going. Do you work with everyday racers or just pros? It's interesting that because I feel like uh, when I speak to people, they feel like I work with a lot of pros. And the truth is I don't. Um, I've worked with probably a handful of professional racers in different disciplines over the years. But the riders that we work with day to day are our normal riders that have jobs during the week, that race on the weekend, that want to get better, that can't train all day, that can't ride and race all day, that can't get on the bike four times a week, and they need something else that's like short, sharp, going to get them the best results. They just want to do the right stuff. They don't have hours to fluff around doing a million different things. Um, they're our riders. They're guys that are like diesel mechanics, that are FIFO workers, that have kids, that have a partner, that have got a family, that have a mortgage to pay, all of that sort of stuff that um, that normal people do that aren't professional riders and racers. You talk about getting stronger to make the bike feel light. How strong is too strong? I've never met a rider that is too strong. And so the reason is the stronger you can get yourself, if you can keep your body weight the same, the lighter the bike will feel. And the lighter the bike will feel, the less energy you use. The thing is with strength gains is you don't gain strength like this linearly. Okay, You don't just keep gaining strength. The longer you train for, the you get this narrowing off curve. So when you start, your strength goes up really quickly and then it starts to taper off like that. And so you're doing a lot of work, but your strength doesn't improve as much. So it's just consistently getting out the strength work. We work at it with uh, th three training sessions per week with our riders. We have some riders that have worked with us for six years, seven, maybe one, one rider even seven years, probably the longest, right? Other riders that have been three, four, five years and they're not too strong. And the reason they're not too strong is because we don't do exercises that get them big and bulky. We get exercises that actually get them just stronger so they can focus on getting the most out of their riding and that's why they can keep at it. If they got too big and bulky and they found their riding gets worse, they probably wouldn't hang around and keep training for that long. Should I do a strength phase and then switch to cardio when I'm strong enough? I do get this one a bit where riders think that they need to have like phases where they just do strength work and just do cardio work depending on where they're at throughout the season. But not something that we do. You can do it, I guess. The downside to that is when you do focus on cardio work, you're gonna lose your strength stuff. And when you just focus on strength, you're gonna lose your cardio. And the thing is for riding and racing, you need both of those. You need to be strong and you need to be fit both at the same time for your riding and racing. So we work on both. Every training session we do with our guys, half of it's made up of strength and lift and heavy, half of it's made up of cardio conditioning interval training. Um, and that works perfectly fine. The reason that it's great is because they can get stronger and they can get fitter at the same time. Um, and they can do it in the same session. So they're gonna feel better on the bike in a shorter period of time when they start working with us and they can feel good all year round rather than having to trade off one for the other, which to me seems silly, but some people do that. How do I test my strength to see if I'm strong enough for racing? Do I just load the bar up? I'm scared of getting hurt. So to have a look at your strength, there is a tool that you can use which is called a 1RM calculator. 1RM stands for one rep max. And what a one rep max is, is the amount of weight that you can lift for a specific exercise for one rep. The thing with testing a 1RM is there's a few things. Number one, it's dangerous. Anytime you test something at its absolute max, it's dangerous. There's a risk of you getting hurt, getting an injury. Your goal, unless you're doing a powerlifting competition, no point at all in testing a 1RM if you're riding, riding and racing. The second thing is it's very taxing on your body, on your nervous system, because you're loading it up to its absolute max. So it could affect your following training sessions or affect your ride for the weekend. Something else we also don't want to do. So we can use a 1RM calculator. You can Google it, but what it will do is you can put in say, like let's say I'm doing overhead press and I'm doing overhead press with uh, 50 kilos for eight reps. Instead of me testing my 1RM overhead press, I can put in to this calculator. I did eight reps at 50 kilos and it's got a special formula and it will give me a hypothetical estimated 1RM of roughly where it is. So you can use that as a measuring tool to see if you're actually getting stronger with your training especially if your reps are changing. So like for our guys, like we'll do four week cycles. They might be doing sets of 12 one week and sets of six one week and sets of eight. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether you're getting stronger. The estimated 1RM calculator will help you to see if you're getting stronger by calculating the 1RM without you having to flog yourself and without you having to risk uh, getting hurt when that's not the goal of your training. Is the carnivore diet good for Hadar Desert Race? There's lots of different types of eating out there. We don't follow any specific type of eating. 
we follow what are the food groups my body needs to be able to perform at its best. So fats, proteins, carbs, they're the three macronutrients that every way of eating, well, most ways of eating follow. The carnivore diet just follows mostly protein, being carnivore, meat. So the problem with that for say Hada is carbs are your primary fuel source, not protein. Protein isn't a very good, fuel, well, protein can be converted into carbs, but it's the most inefficient way of being able to do it. Carbs are your protein source for riding and racing. So if you're not putting carbs in and you're just putting protein in, protein's the building block for your muscles, not a fuel source for the body. So you're gonna find that your energy is not gonna be as good as what it could be compared to using carbs. Most people follow specific ways of eating because it gives them clear rules on how to eat and help them to be able to lose some weight. However, what it doesn't do is teach them how to fuel themselves for riding and racing. There's a very big difference between just trying to lose weight and trying to lose weight and still feel good and perform better. Um, you could not eat all week, right, and lose weight, but you're probably not gonna feel very good, probably not gonna feel very energetic and probably not gonna train well. Great for losing weight, not great for performing. So you need to know how to eat to lose weight, but also how to eat to perform so you can get the most out of your riding. Otherwise you end up hitting one goal of losing weight and working against your other goal of trying to get better with your racing. I know you recommend using a protein powder on race day. Won't this make me big and bulky? The thing that makes you big and bulky is calories. Calories is the amount of food going into your body. So one of the common things I hear with training is people will say, oh, I'm, I get big and bulky every time I do weights. I'll blow out within a week and I start getting massive. That's not true. The weights didn't cause you to get big and bulky and to blow out and get massive. The thing that caused you to blow out and get big and bulky and massive is you did weights and then you started to eat more. And you probably started to eat more because you felt hungrier because you were doing more training. You did more training, your appetite went up, you started to eat more without yourself even knowing it, you're getting more calories in and that's how you got bigger. The way that you don't get bigger is you don't increase the calories, okay? You don't stick more food into your body. If you stick more food into your body, more calories in than what you're burning off, then yes, you will get bigger, whether you're training or not training. So the goal is to make sure that you've got your calories under control with your strength work and your weight work so that you can just focus on getting stronger without giving your body a whole heap of extra, extra food and you blowing out and getting bigger and putting on weight if that's not your goal. Protein itself is not gonna make you bigger. Protein is the building block for your muscles. So when you go and train or when you go and ride, the muscles tear or break down, you get a bit of soreness. It needs building blocks to be able to repair and recover. That's what protein does. So protein is responsible for that process. It is not responsible for you gaining a whole heap of weight. If you eat in excess, that comes down to the calories, okay? So if you ate less calories than what your body needed and you did weight work, you can lose weight. And that's what a lot of our guys do that lose weight. They get stronger and they lose weight at the same time. How do they do that without getting big and bulky? Well, they're using the right exercises, but it's the calories. The calories are the thing that we're monitoring to, make, to see whether they lose or gain weight with the training that we put in front of them. What fitness stuff do you focus on with your Baja 1000 riders? Two things. Strength is probably the, one of the big ones. Strength is getting them stronger. When we can get them stronger, the bike feels lighter. So if they're riding a bike that weighs 120 kilos, then, which would be what, I don't know how many pounds that would be, maybe 200, probably over 200 pounds. So they got a bike that's over 200 pounds, two, 250 pounds. And they need to be able to wrestle that around for a very long period of time, a thousand miles. Then, the stronger we can get them, the lighter the bike feels. The lighter the bike feels, the less energy they'll use when they ride. So if they use less energy when they ride, they can ride harder for a longer period of time. The other thing that we focus on is getting them to do longer rides. When you're doing such a long ride, you have to get your body comfortable riding for that period of time. We've had guys that, that we've worked with, we've been lucky enough to work with one guy who's done Baja twice and another guy who's done Baja once on a bike. And we had them out encouraging them to go and do practice rides. They were doing like practice night rides, practice during day rides, having weekends to go and do long rides and long time on the bike because they need to be comfortable being on the bike. You can't, you can't do one hour practice rides and expect to be able to go and ride for the Baja 1000 and be cool after doing an hour, one hour practice rides every weekend. Your body's gonna be in so much shock um, that it's gonna be very difficult. Maybe it can be done, but it's gonna be extremely difficult for that to be able to happen because it's just too big of a gap. You're trying to get your body to operate up here and you've only been practicing with it down here. We wanna try and level out that gap as much as we possibly can with our practice. I saw this machine you can buy, which is like a bike on a spring. Is this good for enduro fitness or a gimmick? Yeah, I've seen a few of these that have come out over the years. And in terms of helping you with your riding and racing, 
there's a reason that the, those types of products don't stick around. They come out, they look cool, you're like, oh, that's cool, that's a bit of a gimmick, can put that in the shed or you know, put that next to the bike. But you can't actually get strong with it and you can't actually get fitter with it. It just moves you around in a whole heap of weird positions and it, I reckon it looks funny. You might think it looks cool, but I don't. The goal of the training during the week, again, is to build strength and fitness. The best way to build strength and fitness is in the gym. We're in a controlled environment where we can measure things and we can do it on a, in a safe setting. There's no way that you can do that on a spring-loaded bike, okay? There's no bike that you can get that's gonna allow you to build strength um, that you need for the bike, and it's not gonna allow you to build the cardio that you need for the bike. What you need is gym that allows you to build strength and build fitness, and then go and ride your actual bike, okay? Riding a spring bike and riding a real bike, two completely different things if you've raced a bike before. You said to focus on fitness instead of getting better suspension. Isn't bike setup important? So maybe you've taken that out of context. When you're trying to get better, so if you've got a goal, so let's say I'm doing Fink Desert Race and I'm normally running top 300 and I wanna to get top 200. You have to dissect what is the weakness? What is the thing that is actually holding me back from getting into that top 150? It'll come down to three things. Number one, you're not fast enough. You are not a good enough rider, okay? Even if the race was only 10 minutes long, you wouldn't be able to get into the top 150. So you might have taken that out of context. If you're working towards a goal, there's three things that'll get in the way of you getting towards your goal, three things to assess and look at. So let's say I am racing Fink Desert Race and I am in the top 300 and I wanna to get top 200. There's three things that could be getting in the way. First thing that could be getting in the way is I don't have the skills. I'm just not fast enough. Even if the race was only half an hour long or an hour long or two hours long, I still wouldn't be fast enough to be in the top 150. So in that case, you need to get better skills. You need to be faster, get comfortable, go and do a coaching course. Um, go out there and do some practice rides. Get out and do some desert riding or faster stuff. Go and find some new guys to ride with that are faster than you. Second thing is could be bike setup. So let's say you do have the speed, you are quite fast, but your bike is just not set up for you. So let's say you weigh 80 kilos, but your bike's set up for 100 kilos. Then it's probably gonna be very hard for you to be able to do well on that bike because it's gonna feel like it's gonna kill you all the time. You're gonna be slowing up all the time. You're not gonna be able to ride as fast through different sections of the track compared to the other guys. So in that case, the suspension is a valid concern. The third thing is fitness, fatigue, okay? If you are fast enough and you can hang in the top 150 for a period of time and you can hang in that top 200, great. But if you can't maintain that for three hours and you don't end up finishing in the top 200 or you get overtaken by a whole heap of guys at the end of day one or the end of day two, then your fatigue's the problem. You need to get better with your fitness and your nutrition and your food. That stuff has to be dialed in. You haven't dialed it in, it needs to be better. So you can be consistent with your skills. So it's not that suspension is a waste, it's a waste if that's not the problem. So if fatigue's the problem, if you get really, really tired out on the bike halfway through the race and you slow up and you lose a whole heap of spots, then spending more money on suspension is probably not gonna be the answer for you. The same as going and doing a whole heap of more skills work, that's probably not gonna be the answer either. The answer is you need to get rid of the fatigue so the bike can work the same way all the way through the race rather than you riding it at one speed at the start of the race and another speed at the end of the race, which no suspension is going to accommodate for. Um, and same with skills. You can get better with the skills all you want, but if you don't have the endurance there, it's not going to matter. I tried the carb gels every hour and put Paradem in my Camelback, but it upsets my stomach. Does it not work for some riders? Good question. So every now and then I will get this uh, query from riders. What usually happens is a couple of things. Sometimes people just don't tolerate the sweet tastes of different products. So try different products. Don't have Powerade, have Gatorade. Don't have Gatorade, try Staminade. Um, if it's carb gels, if you're using winners carb gels, use a different brand, try a different flavor and see how you go. That's the first thing I'd have a look at. The second thing is, are you having too many carbs? Maybe you're not burning off as many carbs as what you think, or maybe you're not measuring it out. Maybe you're not following the 30 to 50 grams and you're like, oh, Andrew said put Powerade in, Andrew said carb gels, so you're having five carb gels and a whole thing of Powerade and, having, and a whole bunch of lollies and doing way too much and putting too much in and that's why you feel sick. So maybe you need to pay more attention to measuring your carbs out so that you're getting the right amount in. People that say that they don't tolerate carbs, unless you have a allergic reaction, which you would know about because you'd always have that same reaction every time you have carbs, is your body runs on carbs. That's your fuel source for your riding and racing. That's what you're burning through. So you've got to have some sort of strategy to get them in. So it's up to you to find out what works for you and to dial in that strategy so that you don't feel up, your stomach doesn't feel upset, you don't feel sick so you can perform at your best for riding and racing.